Welcome to MUFON Canada's UFO Primer. I'm Dave Palachuk, National Director of MUFON Canada and Executive Producer of MUFON Canada's podcast. MUFON is the world's largest and oldest civilian UFO investigative and research organization with members in many countries around the world. Our number one goal is to be the inquisitive mind's refuge seeking answers to the most ancient question, are we alone in the universe? Simple answer is no. Do you have UFO reports to share, armchair UFO investigator aspirations, or want to train and join our investigative team, MUFON is here for you. Will you please join us in our quest to discover the truth? What do we know after 50 years of MUFON? One, UFOs are real. UFOs represent advanced technology not from any country on planet Earth. Two, we are not alone in the universe. We never have been. Three, according to the data we collect, our universe is teeming with life. And four, the UFO phenomenon is worthy of scientific study because tremendous breakthroughs will result if we allow our scientists and engineers to do so without fear of ridicule. Each episode will feature a guest host along with our very special guests who are willing to disclose their knowledge on ufology. Hope you enjoy the information you hear in this podcast and use it to help decide if you believe. Embrace the future with MUFON Canada. Hello everyone, my name is Dave Palachuk. I am the National Director of MUFON Canada and it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, our guest host who is going to introduce our very special guest for this episode and uh, it is a case right out of the history books from Canada. Our guest host is Linda Refuse from Liverpool, Nova Scotia and Linda has lived in Nova Scotia most of her life She's a manager of two museum sites for the last 30 years. Wow, two. Uh, her interests are history, geology, and ufology. And that's, uh, she says, are her three loves. The ufology is uh, brought on, I guess, from the experience that she had in 1967. Got her started on her way to becoming a field investigator for MUFON Canada. So our Nova Scotian investigator, Linda Refuse. Linda? Thank you, Dave. So today, our guest uh, is retired RCMP constable, James Blackwood of Churchville, Nova Scotia. James, welcome, and thank you for joining us today to share this very interesting story with our listeners. So today, James is enjoying his retirement days, uh, staying busy and enjoys the pastime of daily nighttime feedings of a very large group of friendly raccoons. And James, I have enjoyed uh, watching some of your your videos. But let's jump back to another nighttime in 1978 when the then RCMP Constable Blackwood was stationed in Clarenville, Newfoundland. At about 1.45 a.m., James, his station received an unusual call and um, so I would like to uh, ask that you take it from there as this story all begins with that phone call. Yes, uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, my shift ended at 2 o'clock that morning and, uh, and when I was in the office I, I took the phone call around 10 to 2 and, uh, and uh, it was a local person who I knew down on the waterfront. He said that there was a object in the sky getting closer and closer to a Clarenville that I should check it out. Now prior to this we've had other calls regarding uh, unidentified flying objects and uh, we investigated them that we've never ever seen anything. So uh, I, I didn't think we were going to see anything again. Usually when we get there it's gone. Uh, so when I went there uh, I, I could see it but it wasn't all that uh, visible because it was still approaching and uh, and I said well that's weird I said at first I thought it was a, a planet and then it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and then all of a sudden it was right down on the water right in front of us and I'd say with the size of it about the size of a 737 aircraft and uh, maybe a little bit bigger 
and it's, it was on the water uh, uh, between Clarenville and Random Island, what we call uh, the, uh, the Clarenville Harbor. And uh, the uh, person that uh, called me, he's since passed away, but there was him and some of his family members, I said, well, 12 of us all together were watching this thing, and he had a pair of binoculars. And uh, so anyway, we were watching the binoculars, and once it got so close, we didn't need them anymore. And uh, I, I scooted up to the office, and I, I got, uh, we had a telescope there on loan for drug surveillance called a ball scope. And you can uh, multiply images up to 60 times the normal rate. So I had that all set up in the tripod and everything. And, uh, and uh, when I uh, zoomed in on the craft itself, you could see the metal was like a, it, was a, it wasn't shiny. It was more like a gray, dull type uh, surface. And uh, it looked like it was pit, you know, and, uh, and it had, uh, the bottom part, the whole bottom was all illuminated, and uh, it was reflecting off the water, and um, it just sat there, and then and all of a sudden started moving back and forth, rotating, back and forth, coming toward shore. And so I activated the roof lights on my police car. When I did that, it activated lights on the craft, and uh, my, my friend there that made the call, he asked, uh, he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I thought maybe we could make some kind of a contact. And he said, I'm not contacting anything. I'm getting out of here, he said. <laughs> but I was very drawn to it. Uh, it's a good job it was on the water, because had it been on land, I'd have walked right up underneath it. I, I had no fear of it at all. But it was just something I just couldn't take my eyes off. And uh, it stayed there for about an hour and 45 minutes. And then when it left, it, it came as it approached, started moving off slowly, and then poof, gone like a shooting star, only going the other way. Um, so I went back to the office, uh, but I had already contacted my staff sergeant when I uh, when I got the ball scope, told him you know what was down there. He, and I know if he looked out his bedroom window, he could have saw. But he he didn't want to get involved in. It. You know, I only got a few more. <laughs> years for retirement so <laughs> anyway uh, that's the way it was and then uh, the next day my phone started ringing off the wall at home uh, people wanting interviews of course I denied them I said uh, no comment wouldn't talk to anybody and uh, I think it was the next day my staff started to call me in the office and he said uh, the commanding officer of the division wants you to go and do an interview with uh, Jeff Sterling up uh, at the NTV uh, TV network, and uh, so that's that interview that you see on YouTube today. I was only 25 at the time, and then um, I think CBC did one there later on, but it wasn't as in depth as as what Mr. Sterling's was. He he covered it all the bases of it, but it was a fascinating thing to see. I've never seen one since. And I, like you said, I, I, I did take a lot of ridicule from my fellow members. Uh, our ident section sent a, a picture of a flying saucer and, and it had an alien sticking his head out the window and honoring my name with like a little bubble around there and saying we want Blackwood. And they were calling me Mark for Mark on the radio. And, <laughs> and uh, it was just, you know. <laughs> And I was in the force a long time after that, but every time I met somebody new, they'd say, oh, you're that UFO fellow. <laughs> but but uh, NTV still play that video today, and it's all in years later, they still play it, uh, late at night, and early Saturday mornings, uh, like say around 8 o'clock in the morning, they'll, I, I still see it on TV. But Jim, uh, when you went back when you originally went back to the uh, to the station, were you not given a special paper to sign? Yes, uh, we had to. Uh, we had a C two thirty seven form, uh, uh, and it had uh, a green border down the side and had top secret on it. 
and uh, I had to do up a report and the staff sergeant stayed up with me all night until I got it all done and then he's, we had to seal it in a special envelope that had special secret tape on it, all the rigmarole. He had to lock it in the safe and then it had to be, uh, uh, what was he called back then? It was double registry, they called it, and, and, uh, and that went to uh, Ottawa and then they shared it with the National Research Council. This Dr. McNamara was the fellow that came and did a, a little spiel on what he, what he thought I saw. Out of curiosity, oh, sorry, Linda. Out of curiosity, was that form an RCMP form, or do you think it came from another division of our government? No, no, it was an RCMP form. It had the Royal Canadian Mount Police uh, 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 emblem on the top of it. But uh, we had different forms we used for investigative things, but this is the first time I ever saw anything like this. And uh, he stayed with me while I did it in triplicate. We had the old carbon copies, old carbon paper back. Oh, yes. And, uh, you know, even our CPIC wasn't, it, it was typewriter type stuff. We even still had a telex machine. That's how far back we go, you know. But uh, when that was set off, and I never saw that again. But I did see uh, some people have been able to find copies of that report. And, uh, and uh, there was a member, Cal Davis, he did the investigation <coughs> of me. And uh, he came back, you know, that was, uh, nobody else saw the uh, craft any, any further, and they concluded the file. But McNamara, he, when he, his report, he stated that what I probably saw was the planet Jupiter because uh, <laughs> at that time of year, it rises over the marine, and then this is the way he described it. And I was totally miffed. And, uh, this, uh, I forget what the name of the company was that uh, interviewed me at the time, and I didn't care what the CEO said. I, I tore a strip off him. And I said, he didn't even interview me or the uh, other people that were there. But he came to that conclusion that it was the planet Jupiter. And I said, how in the name of God did Jupiter come down and yeah. sit at the top of the water? Doesn't he realize how big that planet is? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, but yet at the same time, you're asked to fill out uh, a report that's labeled top secret and, yeah. and uh, flown or sent to to uh, Ottawa, so there's a little bit of contradiction there, yeah, I would say. Yeah. I don't know how National Research Council got a hold of it, but I mean, it was sent directly to the commission in Ottawa. Right. That's so, Jim, but what about, uh, I mean, now, like you were saying in the beginning there, that, that you weren't the only witness. There was a group of you, like at yeah. least a dozen other people. Yeah. And you know what the town did? They had a, uh, the Holiday Inn had a, uh, a UFO weekend. And if you, uh, if you uh, won this Holiday weekend on the radio station, they gave you binoculars and a star chart and free room and meals <laughs> for a weekend. Wow. And, uh, and there was people coming from the states and everything uh, to, um, to hoping that they would see this craft again. And they, renamed the uh, hockey team, the gentleman's hockey team was called the Clearable UFOs, which I played, <laughs> I was goaltender for, and we had the red uh, jerseys with a yellow flying saucer on the front of them. I did Clearable UFOs, and the, uh, the local car dealer had a UFO sale for cars, and they had little flying <laughs> saucers in the windows, and so the people were making money off it, you know. Yeah, yeah. and. Yeah. Did, on the map. And what was this the first was this the first sighting? Were there not uh, were did I read that the residents uh, were saying that there had been a couple of other phone calls previous to this sighting? Yeah, there was in, uh, in an area called uh, Lethbridge Bloomfield area and that was uh, about maybe uh, a 15 minute drive out of Clarence. Okay. And that, and that's the area surrounded by water as well. But, uh, but we went down there for that one. The the, the craft was gone. We didn't see anything. Okay. But we took we took the report from the, the local people that were there to witness it. 
Jim, do you think there are of those uh, like the original, the, the other witnesses there who call, who placed that call that night to bring you down to the, to the war, do you think that any of those people would still be uh, around today in Clarenville? Or? Well, I know uh, Jess Lethbridge <coughs> since five, but his, his brother, uh, there's a couple of his brothers still alive. And uh, I know Jess's wife and his family were down there and uh, their sons. And, and uh, it was like, like two in the morning when they, uh, of course, they were all native people anyway. Mm -hmm. And they had to see this thing coming down. And, Mm -hmm. Beautiful clear night. You know, it's, uh, you know, the stars everywhere. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't a better night to watch something like this. Yeah. So there are still people there, probably oh, yeah. in Clarenville, who can talk about it as well as uh, yeah. they yeah. witnessed uh, back then. Yeah. But you did. Uh, you have um, a drawing of it. Unfortunately, no cell phones back then. No. But, um, but you did do a, a drawing of it, did you? Yes, I did, yeah, and I held the drawing up in the video. Okay. Uh, it's just a rough drawing I did there on the, on the desk. Yeah. And it had a, a, a tail at the back of it, but it was, uh, like, I know what the tail is for on an aircraft, but this thing didn't look like it was any use. It was too small to be aerodynamic or anything. So, Jim. The fascinating part was the lights. Jim, you said this was the size of a 737, so you're talking a 100-foot vehicle. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. How about the full dimensions? How thick or, you know, wide or, you know? It was it was an oval shape, and uh, it was uh, the same size all the way around. So it was, uh, you're looking at like a 100-foot diameter, you know, and it was, uh, it was a big craft. So if you take a retrospective idea of a person's height, how many levels do you think were in that craft to our size? I would say probably, I'd say there could be two, maybe three. Okay, that's, that's about what we get all the time. Now, mind you, we can't judge size based on our size because we don't know what size an alien actually is. It could be no. 10 or more stories inside, right? So, anyways, well, that is a typical craft, and uh, that's uh, quite a large one. <laughs> so. so, there's been no nothing more reported uh, since then, Jim, that you know of in well, Clarenceville since '78. Well, at the, the time I had my sighting, there was a Jordanian uh, pilot report uh, an incident around the exact same time that that our sighting happened. They saw the thing leave in the atmosphere, okay. and uh, and Eastern Provincial Airways pilot also reported it. Oh, interesting. But they're so, not in existence today. They're uh, WestJet took over all that area. But uh, at that time was Eastern Provincial Airways. They were the Atlantic carrier at the time. Okay. <clears throat> so, what can you describe how it left the scene, uh, Jim? It just, well, it, it left the same way it arrived. It came down very, very slowly. And then, uh, and after it established how, you know, what, what height it was going to be and, and just stayed there. And then when it left, it left the same way. It started going slowly and slowly. And then when it started to be hard to see, and then it just took off and just gone. And oh, well, yeah, by the way, the, the lights were all turned off this time. When it Even on the bottom? Yeah. Yeah, that bottom light, that was, that was hugely bright. And and you said uh, that it, it it appeared as though it were looking for something? Yeah, it kept going back and forth uh, along the water and uh, moving up and down like a, like a scanning for something, and I don't know. Is that a deep harbor there where yes. it's over? Yeah, it is, yeah. So you're well aware that we've had many cases of underwater UFOs. Um, you ever given any thought that maybe it was searching for another ship that it thought was under the water in that area? Well, I, I don't know yeah. what you, it was doing. You know, to this day, I have no idea what its purpose was. Fair I'm enough. aware of the Sacred Harbor incident here in Nova Scotia. Right. <clears throat> 
Yeah, still ongoing research uh, with yeah. that with that case as well. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, Jim, have you read about two weeks ago the front page of the New York Times? <laughs> and the announcement that, and I'm going to summarize it, UFOs are real. Did you see that article? No, I no, I heard about it. I heard uh, people on Facebook talking about it, but I never, I never actually saw it. All right, so basically they admitted the U.S. government has a vehicle not made on Earth in their possession. So they could have just said UFOs are real, but it sort of indicates Paul Hellyer's comment that UFOs are as real as the airplanes over your head. Yeah. So they have basically said UFOs are real. But you know, I'll tell you, when, when I I was ordered to do my interview, I didn't want to do the interview, and the CEO ordered me, and uh, uh, with the stipulation that they got to uh, view the the video before it went to air, and. Uh, Mr. Sterling told me that the video wasn't touched. It went on as is. They let the whole thing go. So I was surprised at that. I thought they might want to edit something out, you know. But they uh, they allowed it to go on with just the way it was. Jim, after uh, after your interview, and you said that um, the results of the report that you had submitted came back. Uh, with the result that they, their, it was of their opinion that it was the planet Jupiter. Was that? Wasn't what, the RCMP's opinion? Oh, so no, but. The National Research Council. Yeah. But was, was that made uh, public? I mean, you know, I, I just find it interesting that you're made to sign a special piece of paper, but then, you know, it comes back uh, with that result. But were the, um, were, were the results of that? ever published or or put into print it came out in a paper and i had a copy of it and i don't know what i did with it it was called res bureau res bureau investigations and uh and they published uh uh what the results was from national research council the rcmp had no input at all and uh so that's when i when i saw what dr mcnamara said i wrote back to them i gave them my Sense worth and uh, <clears throat> sounds like they were taking uh, examples from the U.S. I'm surprised they didn't call it a weather balloon. <laughs> well, I, mean, I mean, to call it Jupiter, I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't think yeah, and. Yeah, pretty far fetched, especially from our research oh. council. It's a slap in the face to me, and I didn't take yeah. kindly to it. You know. And and it is a slap in the face to you as well, Jim. I mean, you know, back in 1978, but especially now today, in 2020, with what Dave has just said about uh, the Pentagon releasing that, you know, they or the the United States military do have. Um, a um, a vehicle that was not made on this planet. So you know, even more to add uh, insult to insult, um, that it and that it's taken this many years for that to come to light finally. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was transferred to another detachment three years later in uh, uh, a, a place called Wesleyville, and when I was uh, I was contacted by the BBC. They wanted to do a uh, documentary on it, and they were gonna uh, they were gonna use me as in the documentary, and they were gonna have a, a flying saucer, like CGI type, you know, me stand me stand there looking. He was describing what they wanted to do, and so I told them uh, they'd have to contact the COB division, and uh, of course the, the helm had changed by that time, and. They, uh, they wrote back to them, said it was a newsworthy item at the time, and they just wanted to leave it live. <laughs> they didn't allow them to do the documentary. So they were going to try and kind of recreate it in a reenactment. Uh, yeah, they were going to put a story to it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it didn't happen. No, no, they were, they were denied access. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's just such a very interesting story, and 
it's just, it's really so good to see so many of these uh, stories finally coming to to light, but coming back and uh, coming back into the present day when more is being released released uh, by government. Yeah. Well, mine made it was so newsworthy because of who I was at the time, and uh, I wasn't uh, some rookie off the street. You know, I was, I was in the force for quite some time. And, and, and quite, uh, quite a credible witness, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I thought about it after. Should I have reported it or should I just... But then I wasn't doing them any favor down to the uh, people that made the call. I wasn't doing them any favors no. by doing that. So I, I reported it as I saw it. Well, we're glad you did, Jim, because I'll tell you, we get incredible details from police officers, military, pilots... Uh, anybody is a first responder, so uh, when I read cases from what I call super well-trained observers, uh, you can actually picture what happened and uh, getting the dimensions and a little bit more from you, and hopefully we'll get to see the, the diagram, uh, it just puts more credibility to these type cases. Yeah. So. Okay, well, listen, Jim, thank you so much for sharing uh, that story with us, and I hope it goes further. You know, I hope that, uh, I would love to see that there could be some people even in Clarenville today that would still like to talk about that, and, uh, and remember, you know, usually when you have an experience such as what you had, uh, it doesn't matter how many years go by, you still see that experience as clear in your head today as when it happened uh, all those years ago. So there, you know, it would be interesting to see just how many people there might still be in Clarenville who saw what you saw that night in 78. Uh, there they, was another, you, sorry, there was another sighting that happened two years ago. Oh. And uh, in Clarenville, and the guy had a, he took a picture of it, and I, I don't know why he forgot about the picture, but he did, and it was in February that he got it. And he never saw it in his camera until like that summer. And oh. then he said, oh, I remember I taking that picture. I know if I took a picture of a UFO, <laughs> I'd have a great right, right away. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it, uh, they contacted me, CBC Gander contacted me, and they, we did an interview with sort of rehashed what I saw, and then they wanted my view on what this fellow probably saw, you know. Okay, yeah. But, uh, it sort of died out, and I never heard any more about it after. What year was that? Do you know, Jim? The second two one? Two years ago. Well, two years ago. Yeah, and it was in the uh, the Clarenville newspaper there, the packet it was called, the Clarenville packet. And they uh, they showed a picture of, uh, they have, they showed the picture of what he had, you know, and he uh, gave the news the picture of what he had, and it looked like a, a craft, you know. Wow. Have you seen the picture? Yeah, I did, yeah. Was it anything close to what you saw? Yeah, it was, yeah, I'm surprised. Linda, Linda, you have a little investigation to do. I can see that. <laughs> You're going to go find that paper. Yeah. What you said it was called the packet. The Clarenville packet. Yeah. Clarenville packet. All right, I'm on it. <laughs> and they did, a, they did a big story on me there as well. Uh, they, uh, had, they had uh, raided around the same time, and they they had me back out again in my big picture there. And present so day. They, yeah. kind of maybe like an anniversary uh, edition. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yes, absolutely, we need to check that out. Yeah. Yeah, when you get that picture, I'd like to put that up, put it up beside yeah. Jim's. The Canadian Mint did a, a coin of Shag Harbor last fall. Yes. Yeah. I have one. Oh, nice. Yeah. I couldn't. I ran out by the time I ordered mine. Yeah. There's, yeah. A new, there's a new one coming out in the fall. Yeah, I'll be the first to order it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, who is the, who's uh, the new second. one? Hmm? Who is the new uh, the new coin that's coming out? I can't tell you. <laughs> You'll have to okay. say. Oh, okay. I'm, not, I'm bound by a contract, not to say. Uh, all right. So <laughs> we might, might have a little hint as to what it might yeah. be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a UFO. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's oh. pretty awesome, though, Jim. I think yeah. that's great. But we uh, we will check that out. We will follow up uh, to try and see to try, see if we can get that article from the uh, Clarenville packet 
and with that uh, photograph and, yeah. and you know certainly let you know uh, what came of that yeah. and as Dave says he can post that as well I have the uh, I saved the video of uh, of me talking with the Gander uh, radio so I can I can uh, I can send you that if you want I have it done on YouTube sure oh that's on your channel uh, Jim yeah I'll, uh, yeah. I'll I'll post it. Uh, I yeah. think I, yeah, I think I have it on my channel. My interview with Gander. Do that. And the that's date, what the I date. want. Everything will be on it. Yeah. All right. If you don't mind, I'll I'll um I'll reference that so people can go see it. Maybe even yeah. put a copy on our channel so they can find it. Um, I'll I, send that to you directly. Fantastic. Yeah, move on Canada. These uh, podcasts that we're doing, which we call the um, UFO Primers. We're concentrating on Canadian cases and digging up old cases to basically say, look, this is reality back then, and it's been confirmed now. And all these people who are skeptical or ridiculed other people, um, guess what? It's true. So that's why we're concentrating all this. Uh, we're hoping MUFON Canada is sort of the go-to for ufology in Canada, where to get all this information in one big concentrated database. Uh, MUFON International, we have 100,000 cases to pull on, so uh, Canada gets its fair share, 10% of the U.S., because 10% of the population. And uh, a lot of them, 5 to 8%, are unknown, classified as unknown, real UFO sightings. Yeah. So there's a lot of great stuff. Uh, yours, unfortunately, was never a MUFON case, but it, uh, it's not necessary that it has to be in there. Uh, I appreciate your uh, your efforts. Um, thank you for the interview, uh, Linda. I'm sure you have a couple more things to say, but I, uh, I also want to say thank you for your service to the citizens of Canada as an RCMP officer. I know that's a pretty tough job. Yeah, it so, is sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, and uh, thanks for not uh, walking away and saying I don't want to get involved. It's uh, history's not making by uh, made by people who ignore the facts. So. And and thank you too, Jim, for standing by your story, no, because you. you were given other opinions, and uh, and you did stand by your story, which is certainly the true one. Thank you. So thanks for being our guest, and uh, we will definitely uh, keep you posted on what we find out uh, with following up on this other story. And, uh, and we will continue also to enjoy watching your nightly feedings with your raccoons. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's a great it, thing. It, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sure. Thank that you do as well. Yeah. Thank you, Constable Blackwood. It's been a pleasure. Okay, thank you very much, Dave. Linda? It's been great to meet you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.